إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah We praise him abundantly and we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray. And whomsoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance, then no one can guide. And I bear witness, as you bear witness, that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, the exalted, alone with no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger. May Allah exalt his mention. May Allah grant him peace. And may Allah send his blessings upon him, his companions, his wives, and all those who follow them on their righteous path until the day of recompense. Brothers and sisters in Islam, first and foremost, I thank you for taking the time to attend this particular event. Because you could be doing something else. You could be shopping, you could be enjoying the rain. I don't know if you do that usually. You could be spending time with your family. Many different things that human beings have their means and the abilities to do. But for you to choose to come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first to pray the Salatul Maghrib in Jama'ah, which is 27 times the Salah you would have had had you prayed at home. And then to listen to a lecture which Allah's name is being mentioned and the sunnah of his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being conveyed and we ask Allah to make us among those who convey the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then this is a very big deal it's a big deal that not that many people are invited to you didn't come here on your own uh, because of your own skills or because you're very intelligent even though you may be it is Allah Azza wa Jal who decreed that you come to this particular place and so we praise Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala abundantly for that and uh, Allah brought us here in spite of the discussion which we'll be dealing with. I mean, there is something which usually would prevent us from getting closer to Allah. Not necessarily through a lecture. There are many different ways to get closer to Allah. But there's this one thing which always and forever tries to be an obstacle in our way. And that thing is none but Iblis and his children. Because Iblis has children. And the children of Iblis are the Shayateen. The Shayateen of Ins and Jinn. They are human beings who are Shayateen. Don't look around. Okay, it's like, yeah, that brother over there. No, inshallah, everybody here, inshallah. We ask Allah that everybody's upright. But there are shayateen among human beings. Because you say at the end of Surah An-Nas, min al-jinnati, one nas. So this shaitan um, is not a friendly creature. In fact, he is full of enmity and full of hatred. And he has old school, classical ways of misleading us and he has modern ways. He actually develops with the development of human beings. He uses the same technology which we may use to service the deed of Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same things are used by shaitan to lead the masses astray. So he's up to date. You don't need to update him. And because of that, it requires that we become familiar with these modern traps, because we're living in modern days, to avoid falling into his traps. People back then, at the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and afterwards, if they wanted to sin, it was not as easy as today. Just an example. If a man wanted to see a half-naked woman, 
he would have to actually go out fetching to find a woman. Then that woman has to be an evil woman. Then she has to be half naked. Then he has to have access to see that. Many different steps may be taken. Of course, he may be riding a horse or a donkey or a camel. It may, it may take him hours looking around and find nothing. Nowadays, you pick up your phone. You go to YouTube. You type in a keyword and it's all there. That's modern. That wasn't available then, it is available now. And if we don't realize that, we may fall into these traps of shaitan and we may be led astray and lead others astray while thinking that we are rightly guided. Because one of the tricks of the shaitan is to mislead someone while making him think that he's rightly guided. Whosoever turns away from the remembrance of Allah, the Quran and the Sunnah in general, we shall assign for him a devil. This is Allah's words. Nuqayyid, taqyid. It's like there's a, there's a, they're cl clipped together. They're attached together, they're latched together. Nuqayyid lahu shaytanan, fahuwa lahu qareen. Qareen is like your close companion, one who's very near to you. And then what does he do after he becomes your best friend? وَإِنَّهُمْ لَيَصُدُّونَهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ And these shayateen will be misleading the people, their, their people who are accepting them, away from the path, and then the key word, or the key sentence, وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ While they think that they are rightly guided. So it is one thing to be deceived by him, and it's another thing to be deceived to the extent that you do not even realize you have been deceived. And this is when the calamity strikes. When a person reaches this particular level, nothing is effective unless Allah wills otherwise. You give him nasiha, he doesn't accept. You advise, he rejects. You remind, it goes from this ear to that ear. It doesn't go through the heart. All these sins created veils over the heart. And so when the nasiha comes, it doesn't have a path. It doesn't have a place to enter. It is rejected by the ran, by the sins. And so they do not understand, they do not comprehend, they do not see. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not the vision which goes blind, it is the hearts which are within the chests. Because of this fact, and because many Muslims have fallen exactly into that, it becomes necessary that we equip ourselves with the tools and the means and the knowledge and the application of the knowledge by Allah's tawfiq, Allah granting us success, not individually, to be able to preserve ourselves, to contain ourselves, and to ensure that we remain within the boundaries of Allah so that we can stay on the Sirat al Mustaqim. Because the Sirat al Mustaqim is, is, is not free of temptation. There are people, shayateen, trying to take us away, can come as a shortcut. I'll give you a shortcut. Why do you have to do all this hard work? And we will see some of the examples during the lecture, inshallah. Trying to make it seem like it's simple. Wallahu ghafoorun rahim. You know, that's the fatwa that most, most non-practicing Muslims give you. Say, brother, you know, this is, uh, this is not really good for you. Akhi, Allah is ghafoorun rahim. Allah is forgiving. You're going to make life difficult for us? Subhanallah. What is this pick and choose in the book of Allah? What happened to Inna Allah Azizun Dhuntiqam? Allah is full of might and revengeful. What happened? Inna Allah Shadeedul Iqab. Allah is very severe in punishment. Nabbi ibadi anni ana al ghafoor al rahim wa anna adabi huwa al adab al alim. Convey to my slaves that verily I am the most merciful and most forgiving and that my punishment is the most severe punishment. And the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to, not to convey to the ibad both, not one without the other. So we can't be taking that, that side road. 
We have to remain on the path. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us to leave us unattended. It wasn't, we weren't created in vain. We were creating for, created for an objective. Can anyone tell us what that objective is? Can you give me a dalil? Beautiful. Many people have not يعني, come across or they didn't really pay attention to the following ayat. The following ayat, by the way, are very much relevant to this one. ما أريد منهم من رزق وما أريد أن يطعمون. Allah does not expect sustenance from us because He is, He is in Allah who الرزاق ذو القوة المتين. It is Allah, the sustainer, the one full of power, the most strong. Subhanahu wa taala. People usually give you an excuse that, brother, I cannot do this objective of worship, the objective of life, which is ibadah, because I'm trying to earn a living. So they earn a living in haram or they are too busy to pray and the shaitan has trapped them in this fashion because they think that they're accumulating sustenance while Allah told us that he created us not for that, for ibadah. When you do ibadah, Allah is ar-razzaq. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ When you do the, what Allah wants of you to do, then Allah is the one who will make a way out for you from every difficulty and He will provide you from places you do not expect. Some people think that you'll be walking down the street and suddenly, a, you know, a bag of gold will drop on your head and say, oh, you know, where did this come from? Say, brother, you've been among the atqiyya, so this is the risk which Allah sent you. This is not how it works. If that happens shared with us, that'll be an interesting story. But that's not how it works. It means that the, it could be that Allah will bring you some uh, irth, some inheritance money, which was not in your, you know, not on your mind. It wasn't, you know, part of your plan. It could be that Allah will give you a job better than your previous one, and so you have more sustenance. Or it could be that Allah will simply bless what He has given you already, because two people can make. I'm not really familiar with the ringgits here, the value. But let's say two people can make uh, ten thousand riyals. Let me speak in from where I'm com coming from. How much is that in ringgits? Anyways, ten million ringgits. Okay, be generous. It's free. Two people can make the same amount of money. And, as, and one of them makes it in halal and the other one makes it in haram. And so the one who makes it in halal, Allah Azza wa Jal preserves his money so he doesn't spend it except on things which are beneficial and, and wholesome. And the other one makes possibly more money or the same money from haram and then he gets in an accident and then he goes to the hospital and he winds up paying all that and he needs to borrow even money from outsiders to, to pay off the debt. That is one of the means where Allah will bless the rizq. So don't look at figures because figures don't do it. So the objective of life is ibadah. And that is, Allah gave us particular faculties through which we can identify the truth, we can analyze the truth, and then we have the ability to follow the truth. And so Allah gave us al sam'a wal basar wal fuad. Inna sam'a wal basar wal fuad kullu ilayka kana anhu mas'ula. The hearing, the sight, and the heart, meaning the intellect, because we know that we think as per the Quran in our hearts. Whether science recognizes that or not, whether there's a relation between the heart and the mind, Allah Ta'ala a'lam. But we know that Allah says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts with which they do not understand. So as a Muslim, from the good character, حُسْنُ الْخُلُقْ مَعَ Allah, is that you don't take the opinion of a scientist and reject the statement of Allah. If Allah said that, we submit. If Allah said that the wall has an intent, يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَنْقَدْ جِدَار يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَنْقَدْ فَأَقَامَهَ Allah said the jidar, the wall had an intent, we say the wall had an intent. Why? Allah used the verb you read for the wall. So we submit to Allah. We don't say, but the scientists say, well the scientists said that we were, the earth was flat. And now they say that it is not. 
So they, the science is something which is changeable. They study, they discover things, and they say, oh, sorry guys, what we thought was a fact, you know, 200 years ago, we realized this is nothing but, you know, a theory. So we don't rely on science. The heart, we are responsible for all of these. And as the ulama say, al-qalb huwa sultan. The heart is like the commander-in-chief. He is the general of the army, and the rest of the body parts are the soldiers. If the heart is sound, أَلَا وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَةً إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم You all know the hadith. In the, in the body there's a, a piece of flesh, a morsel. If it is sound, if it is intact, if it is pure, then the whole body will be pure. If it is corrupt, then the whole body will be corrupt and that is the heart. So the shaitan primarily tries to take us away from Allah by taking over the heart. Once he controls the heart, then the limbs will follow. Because the heart is the, is the one in charge. And so when he gives commands, the limbs will obey and will do what is commanded. So the heart, how is it? How often do we check it? How often do we think about it? Do we even think? Have we ever taken a few minutes and said, you know, my heart, is it, is it sound? Is it pleasing to Allah what is in my heart? Am I, am I a righteous slave of Allah? Or is our hearts have been hardened by sins? It's a very delicate matter that we often are too busy with the dunya to reflect upon. Even though this is the most important thing. Because Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, he begged Allah in Surah Al-Shu'ara after he established Tawheed and وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ He mentioned the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he said he begged Allah to make him from وَرَثَةِ جَنَّةِ النَّعِيمِ Then what did he say at the end of the dua? وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ and do not disgrace me. This is Ibrahim, the Imam, whom Allah made an Imam. The Imam of the Muwahideen, the Hanif, the one who was, a, who was willing to slaughter his own son. فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ He put his son for slaughtering. وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا إِبْرَاهِيمُ قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا But before that, he was willing to sacrifice his son. Which one of us is able to do so right now? Which one of us can see in the dream that Allah commands it? Because the, the dreams of the Anbiya is wahi from Allah. Which one of us will dare to do it? Our Iman doesn't allow us to do it. Ibrahim, who had all of these privileges, was asking Allah, do not disgrace me on the day they are resurrected, on the day where no mal, no wealth, wala banu, no children will be of any benefit, illa, except, excuse me, except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. Salim, a peaceful heart, a heart full of tawheed, a heart full of the love of Allah, a heart full of the fear of Allah, a heart full of sincerity, a heart full of obedience. If, it, if we don't have these qualities, then we're disqualified. We're disqualified from the Qalbin Salim, which means there's khizi, there's disgrace on Yawm Al Qiyamah. So you see how serious the matter is. There will be no questions, by the way. Some, sorry. There will be no question and answer session. So it's better to focus on the talk as opposed to spend time writing because I will not be able to answer it either way. I'm sorry. Um, you can come on you know, chatislam.com every Friday and Tuesday and there's a one hour Q&A session. And if I have an answer, I will answer you live online. But during this particular lecture, because of time constraints and we're coming quite a distance, I apologize, I will not be able to answer your questions. So stay with me for the next, I don't know how many minutes. The heart then, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is a very serious matter. And when the heart is sound, then everything else is going to follow. 
and when it is not, then everything else is going to follow. So before we pay attention to many different outwardly things which are of importance, otherwise Allah would not have revealed them. No one can say, yeah, this part of Islam, ma fi mushkilat. you can leave it alone, it's not important. If Allah revealed it, if Allah sent Jibreel to the Prophet ﷺ to convey to him, believe me, whatever it is, it is important for Allah. Even if it's a sunnah, mustahab, it's not obligatory, it is important to Allah. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been revealed. It would have been left with the knowledge of Allah which we were not told about. If it, because there are things which Allah didn't mention. Sakata anha subhanahu wa ta'ala, rahmatan bina. If it is mentioned, it's important. But before we look at the outwardly, we need to analyze what is within. And this is where the battle between us and the shaitan is really hot and heated. This is when you really get down as they say. How much or to what extent are we defeating him? Or have we been defeated? Have we been defeated and we don't even realize it? Have we given up already and submitted to him so that he will take us with him to Jahannam without even realizing it? I hope from this lecture, inshallah ta'ala, we will be able to understand the means from where he tries to enter and then we will create blocks. We will put a block before him so that he has no access to us. Inshallah ta'ala. I wanted to actually deal with the idea of what is shaitan? Is shaitan a concept? Is he an idea? Is he a fallen angel? As in Christianity? There are many different opinions that the people have, you know, made up on their own, I guess. But we refer back to the Quran and the authentic sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And when we do so, we know that Allah Azza wa Jal said that he had created jinn from nar. Sahih? He was made from smokeless fire. And Iblis is from the jinn. وَاَذْقَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا Iblis. So Allah commanded the Malaika and Iblis was among them, not an angel. He wasn't a Malak. He commanded them to prostrate to Adam. Is it the prostration of Ibadah? Did Allah command the, the angels to worship Adam? Is it possible ever in the deen of Allah that shirk will be allowed? Never. What kind of, what kind of sujood was it? Respect. Obedience to Allah, respect to Adam. This was lawful not only at the time of Adam up there, it was lawful at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam. His own parents and his own siblings, they prostrated before Yusuf alayhi salam when they came on the arch. You all know the story, you read Surah Yusuf. It's clear. That doesn't mean that they were told to worship Yusuf alayhi salam, nor, was the, nor were the malaika commanded to worship Adam. It, is, it was legislated then as means of respect. Now, when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sent, even that was no longer allowed. Sujood became for Allah alone. There was no longer sujood of, of respect and sujood of ibadah. Any sujood is ibadah. That's why you're not allowed to bow to anyone. You know, some people play karate and all these taekwondo, and they, you know, they go bow to each other. And they, Hold on, man. Take it easy, brother, you know. Just go like this with your hand. Say, but you know, the, the game. He said, the game, but Allah. Allah said, you know, you don't, you don't do ruku or sujood for anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a form of, you know, you know what I'm saying. Ala kulli hal, the point being is that he is from among the jinn. And the jinn are made of smokeless fire. So he's not an idea or a concept, he's a physical being. He's a physical being which Allah azza wa jal created. Some say, why would Allah create shaitan, iblis? The first thing is, you don't ask such questions. لا يسألوا عما يفعل وهم يسألوا. Nobody questions Allah in this sense that why did you do that? Because some people do that. Why did Allah do that? Say, you know, you have to have adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and we learn this from the prophets. The prophets, when they spoke about Allah, they had the most adab subhanahu wa ta'ala. They wouldn't even, you know, he's, Ibrahim said, وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ 
فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ When I become sick, Allah is the one who cures me. But in essence, do you become sick without Allah making you, allowing you to become sick? No. They're both from Allah. But Ibrahim attributed sickness to himself and the cure to Allah. Adab. Same thing with Al-Khadr. When he went, he would mention that I'm the one who did this. Whenever the, when he killed the boy, it appeared to be evil. He said, I did it. When he removed that, that you know, from the, the, from the ship, he made the ship drown. He attributed it to himself. But when he fixed the wall, he attributed it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adab with Allah. But if you're asking as to understand the wisdom behind it, then we know that Allah said, "When ablukum bishari wal khairi fitna," everything is a test. If there was no evil in this world, if there was no shaitan, there will be no test. If there will be, if there was no test, there's no earning anything. And we we learn in life that you have to earn things. Wouldn't it be nice if we came to the university here and said, uh, "My name is uh, Muhammad Sharif, and I am, you know, I am one of the descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." They say, "Fantastic! Here's a degree." Would they do that? Even if you were, they will say, "Okay, you have to enroll in such and such class. You have to pay this kind of tuition, and you have to, you know, attend classes, do your homework. You have to earn it." If everybody was allowed and given a degree, even if they didn't qualify, this is injustice. And Allah Azza wa Jal is Al-Adl, the most just. So Allah decreed that this is the case in order for us to reacquire a, a place in Jannah, which we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us. Now, what is the objective of Shaitan? What is his goal? To entertain? What is his main objective? To deceive. Which is, which is going to end up where? Khalas. His main thing is to take you to Jahannam. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ فَاتَّخِذُهُ عَدُوًا إِنَّمَا يَدُوا حِزْبَهُ لِيَكُونُوا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ Verily the shaitan is, is, an, is an enemy to you. This is Allah's own declaration. Allah himself is telling us, Verily shaitan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. Have you ever looked up the word enemy in any dictionary? Look it up. When you're done with the lecture, open any dictionary, Oxford, Collins, whatever you want, and read the definition of enemy. You will find nothing nice. Nothing nice. Not someone who will invite you for breakfast. And not someone who will, you know, who will help you at the time of need. You will find someone who intends evil for you. He's a foe. He's someone who wants to, you know, uh, uh, basically afflict harm upon you. Someone who wants your destruction. Someone who hates you. Someone who envies you. It's all nothing but evil. And the last thing is that shaitan is a adu. He's an enemy. So take him as an enemy. Don't make him your qareen. Don't befriend him. What does he want? His main thing is to invite his 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 cult his group to be among the inhabitants of the hellfire the companions of the hellfire how does he do that number one modern and classical trap of shaitan is exaggerating one matter on the expense of others he loves to do that he comes to the practicing muslims you see, the people that are in a bar getting drunk, he doesn't have much to do with them. He's already gotten them. They're pretty much khalas. They're some of his followers or one of, their fo one of his followers. He really wants you and he wants me. We are the tough ones. We are the ones who have resistance. We are the ones who don't, who put up a fight. We are the ones who don't give up. We are the target. So he will come to one of us and he will make us exaggerate one matter while neglecting many other more important matters. And Islam is a deen of balance. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا We have made you a balanced, middle kind of nation. We don't go to either extreme. No ifrat, no tafrit. No, no extremism and no negligence. No overindulgence and no carelessness. We have to remain in the middle path. In regards to everything about Islam, 
Once we go to one of these two things, shaitan is successful. He doesn't care much really whether you are going to ghulu or whether you have tafreed as long as he's gotten you in one of them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during when he was on Hajj alayhi salatu salam and he told one of the Sahaba to pick up the, the hasa, the pebbles for stoning the jamarat. And he picked up the, the, the jamarat. He showed them to the Sahaba in terms of size. He said like this. وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوُّ فِي الدِّينَ أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ O people, woe to you. I warn you against extremism in the religion. إِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ مَنْ قَبْلَكُمْ الْغُلُوُّ فِي الدِّينَ The only thing which destroyed the nations which preceded you was extremism in their religion. And he said that in the context of showing him the size of the pebble. The size of the pebble. Subhanallah. The context of the hadith has to show you how easily someone can go to غُلُو. So the shaitan is always trying to have us go to extremes. We need to remain on the middle path. What is the middle path? The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There are things which Allah made easy. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want to make things difficult. There are some ruqas, concessions which Allah gave. Enjoy them. It is mercy from Allah, enjoy it. No one has the right to say, you cannot do this rukhsa. Allah gave me this rukhsa. Don't go to extremes by preventing what Allah made halal. It's sadaqah from Allah, as the Prophet ﷺ said, accept it from Allah. The other extreme is negligence. They don't follow, there are things which the sunnah does not stipulate. Say, brother, but you know, today, you know, we have to really take it easy, you know. People have changed, so we can, you know, water down the deen and, and take out some things which make the deen appear to be extreme, just to make the people happy. And then, what happens? After you're done, you ask the people, are you happy? They say, no. We want more and more until there's nothing left. So, as they say in, in Arabic, a proverb, Trying to please the people is something impossible. I'll give you a story that they usually quote the ulama. They say there was a father and his son and a donkey. They were together. The father was riding the donkey and the son was walking next to the father. Okay? And they're traveling. They went by a town. The people of the town saw them said, look at this, look at this father, merciless, no compassion, insensitive, you an old man, you know, not very old, still in shape, mashallah, 40 years old, got your muscles, got everything going on. You ride on the donkey and you let your young child walk, you know, in the heat of the desert, on the sand. What, you know, what is, what kind of father is this? They overheard them. So he said, my son, you know, I'm going to go down and you're going to get on this donkey. So then they, he let the son ride the donkey and he was walking next to him. They finished that village, they went to another village. And the people observing them said, look at this undutiful son. Look at this terrible child. How does he ride the donkey and let his father walk? This is, you know, this and that and this is uh, and whatever. He said, man, what's up with these people? Huh? He said, I'll tell you what. Let us both ride the donkey. What are we going to do? So they both ride on the donkey. Khalas, now people should be supposed to be happy. They go by a third village. The people said, no mercy on the donkey. Two people on the donkey. The donkey cannot accommodate two people. And no, no, no mercy, no rahma for the hayawan. So now we have three. What is the fourth option? That they don't use the donkey. They just walk next to it. So they did. He said, that's the only thing and I doubt anyone will have anything to say. So they do that, they go by a fourth village. They say, these people are stupid. Allah gives them a donkey and they go walk next to the donkey. They don't ride the donkey. And so what is the moral behind the story? You can't make people happy, man. They always have something to say. Some people are just critics, born critic with critiques. They always looking for anything. You say 100 good things and 0.01 bad. They say, brother, by the way, you should pay attention to yourself, Akhi. You're going to lead the masses astray. What? You said, ah, instead of e, brother. Say, this is extremism. 
We have to be moderate. Not per our hawa, not our desires. No, we have to adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Whatever it made flexible, we make flexible. Whatever it made restricted, we make restricted. We have to go by the sunnah in this fashion. So one of the traps of the shaitan is this idea. We have to be careful. The other one is when he comes to individuals in the same light, favoring or exaggerating one matter over others, he says to one of us, your salah, perfect. You should see yourself in salah. Stand there with khushu'ah. You look in the place of prostration. MashaAllah. Brother, no matter how much you sin, ma fi mushkila. This is the fight, satanic fatwa. Don't worry. Because salah, you know, is hasanat. Then he will give you another fatwa. He will tell you, inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat. The good deeds will erase the bad deeds. Huh? And then, أُولَيْكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ He will give you all the ayat to make you feel, make us feel, that no problem, you can continue to sin, as long as your salah is good, no problem. This is exaggerating one matter over the others. If our salah was really good, what will happen? What does Allah say in the Quran? إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ If that salah was really that good with khushu' it would have prevented us from this kind of evil and this abhorrent act. If it is not doing so, meaning the salah was never good to begin with. But the shaitan will use this as a trap. Okay, barakallah feek. The second misconception or trap he has is you're a nice guy. Huh? You meet many Muslims, they don't pray, they may fast, you know, two days of the whole month of Ramadan, and they may have all kinds of masaib, calamities, and you say, Akhi, you know, this is very dangerous, brother. This is the way that leads to Jahannam. He says, yes, but I'm very nice with people. I don't steal. I don't steal from anyone. I don't disrespect anyone. I don't take the rights of anyone. Okay, and, and so the shaitan justifies that it's okay to abandon the rights of Allah provided that you are a nice guy. And that is incorrect. If that was, if that was an effective tool, then the nicest person ever was who? The Prophet ﷺ. So why was he praying until his feet would swell if being nice was sufficient to dissolve you, or to uh, absolve you, I'm sorry, of the responsibility of ibadah. So that is one of the tricks of the shaitan. The third one before the three minutes, uh, and before the adhan, don't worry, we'll continue inshallah after the salah, bi'idhnillah, is the, the good intention. I have good intentions, my niyyah is good. And so all kinds of evil is committed by the good niyyah. I remember in one of the lectures, I was telling the brothers earlier in, in India, uh, during the Q&A session, sorry we won't have one now, a brother said, a brother, um, I have a girlfriend, and I know it's haram, but I'm afraid to break her heart. So, see how the beautiful Nia. Oh, brother, what a sweetheart. You're so concerned about the young lady. He doesn't want to break her heart. So he remains with her in haram. Huh? Both of them on a one-way ticket to Jahannam. Ma fi mushkila. But let's not break each other's hearts. Good niya, wrong deed. Don't fall for that one. Okay? Many times a good niya does not do the job. We must make sure that the deed itself is pleasing to Allah, then the niyyah will be of, of much value. But evil deed with good niyyah is not going to do it. And so with that, inshallah, we will uh, stop for the adhan. And bi-idhnillah azza wa if Allah grants us the ability, we will continue with, with more after Salatul Isha. Zakum Allah khair. Bismillah. الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد أو praises due to Allah we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم we continue where we left off in regards to the various modern and said classical traps that the shaitan uses against us and we were dealing with you know I'm a nice uh, the good intention I have good intentions we said as nice as the intentions may be the deed has to be in agreement with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
who said man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad anyone who doesn't anything which is not in accordance with this affair of ours shall have it rejected it's a good niyyah but the deed Allah will not accept فمن كان يرجو الله فليعمل عملا صالحا ولا يشرك بعبادة ربه أحدا so the deed has to be صالح صالح is according to the sunnah of the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم one of the means is memorizing the Quran memorizing the Quran because whenever you memorize the Quran particular titles are granted to you automatically حافظ the Hafiz Fulan. And when Fulan becomes a Hafiz, the Shaitan, as uh, many of the Ulama uh, had mentioned, like Ibn al Jawzi and others, that this is his actually trap against the Qurra, the reciters of the Quran. He will make them feel that because the, the level of attachment they have with the Book of Allah, their ability to recite it, the uh, memorizing the speech of Allah, doesn't really cut it because we know among the most deviant groups those who wind up fighting against the leaders and this they were actually more than that the prophet ﷺ said to the sahaba if you were to compare your ibadah your salah your siyam to them you will find that you're nothing yet yet they were far away from being on the path which leads to jannah and Firdaus and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So, memorizing some information or the Quran or the Sunnah is not sufficient. One has to adhere to that which he has memorized and act upon it. Because Al-Amal Bil-Ilm is what it all boils down to. Acting upon the knowledge. Otherwise, Iblis himself was quite knowledgeable. Iblis himself he believes, he, he believes in a sense that he, he knows there's Allah alone. He knows there's Malaika. He knows there's Rusul. He knows there's the last day. He knows in the scriptures. He, he had knowledge of these. But it wasn't Iman which will lead to submission to Allah. So merely knowing without acting upon it is a satanic understanding of life. Which we have to strictly avoid. Uh, among the means that the shaitan uses to trap us is procrastination not the easiest english word but we can add it to the dictionary or our vocabulary pro and usually they you know you divide it into different syllables so it's easier to pronounce pro crass t -na -shin. procrastination what does it mean Baden. i don't know if you're familiar with the arabic terminology but just so we can add it. Ba'den is, uh, is, is local dialect actually. Not necessarily uh, from the traditional Arabic language. Ba'dahin or fima ba'd. But Ba'den means later. Sawfa, tasweef. Everything is later. Uh, brother, you know, uh, have you been praying five times a day? Do you get up for Fajr? Brother, I'm single. Oh, and what is the relation between being single and not praying Fajr? Well, no one wakes me up. When I get married, I have a wife, my wife will wake me up. Until then, I am exempt from praying Fajr and Jama'ah. Very interesting uh, philosophy. So people come up with all kinds of things as to why they, are, they can wait longer. I haven't done Hajj. When I do Hajj, I will repent to Allah completely. It's one of the biggest tricks of the Shaitan with the Hujjaj. They continue to disobey Allah for years and years and years until the time comes for Hajj. And one will, will make up his mind. Okay, it's a few days. لا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. I will leave alone my spouse. Okay, I will leave alone argumentation. And I will leave alone sin for a few days. I'm in, I'm, I'm in a holy, uh, you know, environment. It's, you know, the, the haram and the mujdalifa and mina. I can leave alone all these sins and be good Muslim and come back. And then I will lead a new life. These same individuals, you see them fighting with the bus driver from before they even make it near the place. We see them all the time. Allah, that's a fight, fist fighting, punching each other. Ya Sheikh, 
If you haven't trained yourself before, you can't do it on Hajj. If you can do it outside of Hajj, you won't be able to. And Hajj, it's wild. All these people, you'll be in the Haram and someone will come and elbow you. Unless you have trained yourself to be patient, you will fight back in the Haram. And people do this. Wallahi, they do it all the time. People fight and scream at you that during Tawaf. They're screaming at one another. Why? The shaitan tricked them for many years. Do Hajj. Good Hajj. Hajj on Mabrur and don't worry about the rest. They go to Hajj and they commit more sin than when they didn't go for Hajj and come back in even a worse condition. These are facts. Doesn't apply across the board. Some people are an exception. Alhamdulillah. But usually that's what happens. So you cannot say, well, when I become, when I do Hajj, then I'm going to become a good Muslim. No, you have to train yourself now. We have to train ourselves now so that when Hajj comes around or the marriage comes around or whatever it is we're waiting for, we're already prepared for it. Procrastination is not going to help. The, among the other means is uh, fake modesty. You know, sister, uh, that is not hijab. That looks like a fashion show. Okay, I'm not talking to any sister now. I'm just saying, you'll see sisters wearing some, some, some clothing which is supposed to be hijab. Supposed to be. But it is not, not in the deen of Allah at least. Not according to the ayah, فَلْيَضْرِبْنَ, فَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُورِهِنَّ عَلَى جيوبهن وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زينتهن. Not according to this standard. Not according to these standards. Hijab that is really not hijab. And so when the sister is advised, preferably, preferably by other sisters, she says, you know, my modesty is in my heart. My heart is pure. My heart is white like snow. It's all good there. So it, what I wear doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I wear. It doesn't matter whether I cover my hair or not, cover my body or not. This is, you're being too, you know, strict and you really don't understand Islam. I love Allah. I love the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We say that's very nice. But you have the wrong idea. If that were the case, then what, why would the Sahabiyat, why would the wives of the Messenger of Allah, Alaihi Wasallam, and the, the Muslim women, the Muhajirat, and from the Ansar, why when the ayat of hijab came down, they didn't even wait. They cut parts of their apron, part of their outer garment to cover themselves with it. And we're not dealing with covering the face or uncovering the face. This is the difference of opinion among the scholars. We're not trying to speak about niqab now. We're just speaking about standard hijab where your hair is covered, your ears are covered, your neck is covered, your chest is covered, and the rest of your body is covered. Not covered by any garment, covered by a garment which makes you unattractive, which doesn't show your body form. Otherwise, we have a hadith which says that among the women whom the Prophet ﷺ did not see during his time is Nisa'un, Kasiyatun, Ariyatun, Ma'ilatun, Mumilatun. They're women who are dressed yet naked. They are deviant. They are going astray and they are leading others astray. They are tempted and they are tempting others. And they, their, head, their hairstyle is like, you know, the camel hump. They shall not enter Jannah, nor even smell its fragrance, even though its fragrance can be smelled from such and such distance. This is what we see today. This is a manifestation of the hadith and the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ 1400 years ago. We see it today. You tell the sister, yeah, sister, fear Allah with the hijab. Says, Brother, modesty, you know, I have modesty in my heart. If the heart was sound, the body would have become sound. They are, they, there's a harmony between them. There's domino effect. One cannot happen without the other. You could look modest outwardly and have a corrupt heart, but you cannot possibly have a sound heart and not be modest outwardly. It works one way without the other. So, you know, this is the uh, piece of advice for the ladies. Don't get upset with me and don't make dua, you know, against the speaker who reminded you of the obligations. I know it's tough. People don't like to be reminded of things that they're trying to keep doing. But then I will be a fake 
individual. I won't be sincere to my brothers and sisters. And be, we'll just be trying to, you know, pat each other's back. Everything is okay, brother. No problem. But that's not how the Muslimin are. والمؤمنون والمؤمنات بعضهم أولياء بعض يأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر until the end of the ayah. Believing men, believing men and believing women are allies. They're protectors of one another. They enjoin what is good, forbid what is evil. Not to make life difficult for people, but to seek Allah's pleasure. That's the obligation of the Rusul. Otherwise, the Rusul would have never told the people about Jahannam. They would have only told them about Jannah. But the first thing the Prophet ﷺ did was what? When he was told, فَصْدَ بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ Proclaim what you have been commanded. What did he do? He gathered all the tribes. And he said, I warn you of the hellfire. The first thing the da'wah began with was warning the people against Jahannam. Then the other things. So he can't be saying, don't scare the people about Jahannam, speak about Jannah only. This is not the way of Allah, nor the way of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You read the Quran, Allah will describe the people of Jannah, then the people of Jahannam. Or the people of Jahannam, then the people of Jannah. Targheeb and Targheeb. Encouraging the people and scaring the people. So we have to follow the same methodology in our da'wah as well. Sometimes it's scary, but that's life. Uh, another one of the traps of shaitan is uh, doubt. Yani, you look at yourself and you say, okay, everybody is doing something which is sinful. Let's say people, and generally people have some sins that they commit on daily basis. Am I extreme? Maybe I'm crazy. You know? Why is everybody okay with these things and I have a problem with them? This is actually one of the ways of the shaitan to, to take you back with the majority. But we learn from the Quran, according to the standards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that numbers are worthless. What is the evidence? وَإِن تُطِعْ أَكْثَرَ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يُضِلُّكَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Subhanallah. Allah says, if you obey the majority of people on earth, they will mislead you from the path of Allah. Most people are doing, most people doesn't matter. What did the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam do? Khalas. This is where we stop. As for the people, we know that in the hadith, the authentic tradition, from the, at the end, from 1,999 will go to Jahannam, including people from Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and one will go to Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, بَدَأُ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأْ فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء قَالُوا مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ قَالَ أَلَّذِينَ يُصْلِحُونَ إِذَا فَسَدَ النَّاسِ Give glad tidings, Islam began a strange few people practicing. Abu Bakr radiya anhu, Uthman, Sahaba. Then it became many. But it will go back to the state of strangeness. So give good news. This is the messenger of Allah trying to convey this information, inshallah, to us who are struggling. We're not there. We're not there. We are far away from being upon the path. But if we are making that effort, here comes the glad tidings from the messenger of Allah. Give glad tidings to the strangers. The Sahaba were never people that were nonchalant. Or they were passive. No, no. What is it? What is it? Who are the, who are the ghuraba? He said, those who rectify or those who become upright when the people become corrupt. And another hadith that they will have the reward of 50 of the Sahaba. Not that we will ever reach their level, but the ajr will be 50 of the Sahaba, the one who holds on to the deen at the time of fitan, like the days we are living and what's coming is even worse. But now we are seeing a lot of fitan already in the Muslim ummah. So adhering to the deen is the path and that will make you a minority, even if you are by yourself. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu said that the, the truth, the truth is whatever, uh, I'm sorry, uh, being, being guided is whatever agrees, agrees with the truth even if you are by yourself. Even if you are by yourself, you are the jama'ah. But alhamdulillah, we have more than that. You're never by yourself. But don't let the shaitan make one of us feel, everybody's doing it, it makes it halal. Everybody doing something does not make it halal. If it is haram, it remains haram. And even if everyone around you does it, we still leave it alone for the sake of Allah. And if you leave something for the sake of Allah, do you lose? Earlier, we were with the brothers, we stopped at a market, um, like Bagala, what do they call it? Like a, a grocery store to get some juice. 
Okay? Sorry, keep using Saudi terminology. <laughs> So we stopped at the grocery store. We wanted to buy some, some Gatorade because we had played some sports. Good, stay in shape. Anyways, so one guy, the one guy was there, uh, he had a no smoking sign. But we didn't find what we wanted. So there was a nearby store. We went to the other's place to see if they have it. And they did have it, but the guy was smoking a cigarette. He was smoking a cigarette. Now, do you want to uh, buy a product which has smoke in it if you're not a smoker? Absolutely not. It's not your taste. If you want to eat a pizza, you don't want to smoke pizza. Okay? Nicotine is just not your thing. Anyway, so I figured, following the traditions of Islam, you give business to the obedient versus the disobedient. So I made it a point not to buy from him because he was smoking a cigarette. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith which the scholars have differed about the authenticity, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَا يُحْرَمَ الرِّزْقِ بِالذَّنْبِ يُصِيبُهُ The slave will be deprived of sustenance written for him because of a sin which he commits. So he's smoking and we go over there and say, oh, I'm not going to buy from there. Let's go back to the old guy who had a no smoking sign. So we went and said, look, we're buying from you even though you don't have the item which we want because you don't smoke. And while I'm saying this, I look behind him and he's selling cigarettes. <laughs> so that was really, a, you know, a very, I try to make it and find a way out of it because I was just thinking that, yes, you know, you're excellent, mashallah, and then the cigarettes are right behind him. And so, okay, I said, well, I have to go and talk to this guy. He said, you know, uh, I'm glad you don't let anyone smoke, but you know, you're selling smoke. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. He said, but it brings people, brings customers, you know? I said, who is the one who sustains you? The customers, the cigarettes or Allah? Who brings you the risk? Do you really think the cigarettes are going to bring you risk? Subhanallah. It's Allah the one who sustains you. You throw them away, Allah will bring you people. You don't need cigarettes, provided you follow the position it's haram, in order for you to gain customers. In fact, I left your buddy because he was smoking. And Allah brought me here because you did not allow someone to smoke on, in your store. So people have this wrong idea that if they obey Allah, they will lose. Never. Even if you buy yourself, if you obey Allah, you shall be victorious. Even if it's after some time. So our main thing is being on the side of Allah and His Messenger وسلم, irrespective of the people. The majority make no difference. It is whoever is upon the truth. Another one of the traps of the shaitan is philosophy. It is amazing how many philosophers the uh, ummah has produced in recent times. Before, the philosophers were restricted to a number of people known by name, known the field they were in and what have you. Today, every Facebook user has qualified to become an, you know, I don't know, from the elite of the philosophers. Not just a philosopher, no, high profile. So then, what, is, what does that mean? What does philosophy mean? It means that people try to justify why it's okay to go against the Quran and the Sunnah. Using all kinds of examples and all kinds of reasons and all kinds of means and continue to fetch and fetch for any statement of any scholar or any we anything in order to justify why it is okay for me to violate the Quran and the Sunnah. And you try to bring the information, the tr authentic tradition, and they will refute you, not with another evidence, because the scholars did that. The scholars would, would refute one another with adab, while following a particular mannerism in refutation. They weren't children like people are today. It's just about attacking the other and putting him down. This is not the way of the ulama. The ulama had adab in there, and the way they dealt with one another when they differed. But they differed with dalil. Dalil bi dalil. Today it's dalil bi aql. I think, I think that we can, you know, Islam is such and such and such. I believe that, you know, Allah would want us to do such and such and such. Lah. 
That's a very dangerous approach. What do you mean you think and you believe? You, you and I have to go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. There's no intellect in there. You use your intellect to what? To understand the Quran and the Sunnah. This is fiqh. You're a faqih, like the, the, the imams of the madhahib, they were fuqaha because they would get the Qur'an and the sunnah and they will deduce usul from them and they will apply the conditions according to these usul. This is when they use their aql, they didn't use their aql in order to reject the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, not deliberately. But today, many, many people are trapped by the shaitan by using philosophy to reject the Quran and the Sunnah. And many examples can be given, but time doesn't allow to give you. But you go on Facebook and you will see plenty of that. And while you're on Facebook, make sure that you do what is pleasing to Allah. And after you do so, make sure you go to one way to paradise. Okay, we have to advertise the... I don't get the chance very often. In fact, I always forget to mention the website, but make sure you go to One Way to Paradise. No uh, spaces, no digits. O-N-E-W-A-Y-T-O-P-A-R-A-D-I-S-E. That's the Facebook and One Way to Paradise.net. Don't go to .com. It's a travel agency. They will send you to Hawaii. <laughs> we don't need you to go to Hawaii. You're good in Malaysia over here. Everything is good. Kuala Lumpur, Mia Mia. So stay here. Not .com, .net. And then, of course, the YouTube. YouTube.com slash One Way to Paradise. So I can get on your case even further from a far distance. But it all, it's all for the benefit of the Muslims, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip. Um, so philosophy, we leave it alone. We, we uh, know our limitations in terms of, of what our mind allows us to do. It's only in understanding the Quran and the Sunnah, not in analyzing them according to our own desires. These are some of the traps, and of course there are many, many more. But I'm sure each one of us has his own individual experience. There may be things which I didn't mention, which we know, excuse me, we have dealt with in terms of fighting against the shaitan. So each one knows his own case. Let us move on to protection, the security. What are the means to protect ourselves from these traps of the shaitan? The first and most important of all, without a doubt, is knowledge. Ilm. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَاعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكْ First, you, we must know. Allah commanded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the Messenger of Allah ever, ever doubt La ilaha illallah even before prophethood? Never. His heart was protected from having any shirk ever. From the time he was perceived until the time he became a prophet until his demis Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Never. Yet Allah commanded him to have knowledge of La ilaha illallah even though he knew La ilaha illallah. That's because there's never enough. There's never enough knowledge of la ilaha illallah means there's a dynamic application of that ilm. You can memorize, you know, the shuroot of la ilaha illallah and the, you know, the three categories of tawheed, fantastic, but that's not enough. Unless there's application, dynamic application of that, then there's really no ilm of la ilaha illallah. So first we must know, because knowing la ilaha illallah means defeating the shaitan. La ilaha illallah defeats the shaitan. So one of the ways to protect ourselves is by learning la ilaha illallah because it closes the door for the shaitan. The second uh, means of protection is sincerity. We ask Allah to make us among them. What did Allah Azza wa Jal say to Iblis? Iblis said, قَالَ فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Iblis actually he made an oath that he shall mislead all of us except the sincere slaves of Allah. مُخْلَصِينَ or مُخْلِصِينَ meaning those whom Allah has chosen, those whom Allah has preferred over others, and those who are sincere. So the more we are sincere to Allah, the less the shaitan is able to trap us. Because Allah saves the mukhlisin. The third is, and, and it's related to this one, is Al-Ubudiyya Lillah. Al-Ubudiyya Lillah. Enslaving oneself while worshipping Allah. Enslaving oneself. Because it's one thing to worship Allah, as some of the du'at mentioned. You can be a, a worshipper, a abid, but not necessarily a abd. 
Right now during Salah, we were all Ubad or Abidin. We were all worshiping Allah in the act of worship, the ritual of Salah. But that doesn't qualify someone to become a slave. What qualifies him to become a slave? When he goes outside and sin is presented, he leaves it alone. Because the same one he was praying to here, he knows he's seeing him out there. So Abd is you're always mindful of Allah. You're programmed. You're programmed around the clock. Around the clock. That Allah is watching. Allah is seeing. Allah will hold me accountable. I need to know my limits. Now we're not malaika. You cannot be perfect as in never disobey Allah. Every son of Adam is prone to fall into error and sin. But when we do so, the best of those are those who repent to Allah. So if someone is falling into sin yet quickly repenting, he's still in good terms. Because in Surah Al-Imran, Allah described them, that, that the Jannah, He said, أُعِدَّتِ muttaqin. Then He mentioned among the qualities, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُوا الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ from the qualities of the muttaqeen is that when they do an abhorrent sin or they wrong themselves, they remember Allah automatically. So they seek forgiveness for their sin. Then Allah asks the rhetorical question. You don't need to answer it. Who forgives the sin but Allah? We already know. Only Allah forgives the sin. And they do not insist on that while they know. So even if we fall into the traps of shaitan, we look at a woman, specifically nowadays, one of the biggest fitan. We look at women, do not let one of us become too comfortable with that. Where he no longer has a sense of shame, a sense of modesty, a sense of remorsefulness, a sense of regretfulness. We must feel guilty if we do that and repent to Allah instantly. When we do so, we are ibad. And Allah said to Iblis, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan illa man ittaba'aka bin al -ghawin. My slaves, Allah saying to Iblis, you shall have no authority over them except those who follow you among the deviators. The exception is among those who follow illa man ittaba'aka. They follow willingly. The abd of Allah, Allah said to Iblis, you have no authority over them. So the more we enslave ourselves to Allah, meaning in Salah, in Siyam, in Sadaqah, and also around the clock in other areas where it's not Ibadah, then the shaitan will have less access to one of us. Fourthly, Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Those who believe and in the remembrance of Allah, their hearts find tranquility. Then again, a rhetorical question. Isn't it that in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find tranquility? And the answer is, absolutely. Some people don't feel this way. A'udhu Billah. Some people reach tranquility when they listen to Beethoven, and Mozart, and 50 cents. I know there's a big difference between all these, but nowadays everything goes. Eh? Anyone who grabs a mic and is able to scream on stage about his drug consumption and alcoholism and the woman that he goes out with, he becomes famous, man. Everybody wants to be like him. They, their hearts find tranquility when they listen to their favorite song. Not when they remember Allah. It's a very dangerous thing. Because Allah described the believer that their hearts find tranquility in the dhikr of Allah, which includes the Quran, which includes saying Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wa La ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Wa La Hawla, Wa La Quwata illa Billah, and so on and so forth. Not in anything else. Where do we find our hearts? The dhikr of Allah. Uh, fifthly, seeking ref refuge with Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ If the shaitan tries to whisper to you, tries to pinch you into sin, seek refuge with Allah. So we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu that before we enter the bathroom, there was a form of seeking refuge with Allah from the khubath and the khaba'ith. And before the recitation of the Quran, we seek refuge with Allah. And before a person has relations with the spouse, they seek refuge with Allah from the shaitan. Many different times that was legislated. Because when we seek refuge with Allah, Allah Azza wa will protect the believer through that ibadah, which is the ta'awudh. 
the ta'awudh. Sometimes we are too heedless to remember that. So even in salah, as the brother told us his uh, story, of course before he said, let's hear it from the shaitan. And I thought I was going to be me, then he said, buster. And I was hoping he would say a word after that. Otherwise, after he introduces, okay, so let the shaitan tell you himself how to get rid of shaitan. But then he said Buster, so I was like, Alhamdulillah, I hope everybody heard Buster. I'm not a shaitan Buster, by the way. We're all dealing with the same situation. It's a very long struggle, but we hope that Allah will aid us and allow us to make it to our destination safely. But the idea is, um, you know, we seek refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shayateen in general. Because in that, Allah's protection is granted for those who seek refuge with Allah. If we don't do so, then the shaitan is given access to one of us. Uh, sixthly, reciting uh, Quran. In fact, particular portions. We learn from the Prophet ﷺ that there are certain suwar in the Quran effective against the shaitan. قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ آيَاتِ الْكُرْسِي صحيح. So these ones we apply. When you finish the salah, you recite ayat al-kursi. Before you go to sleep, you recite ayat al-kursi. At the different times it was legislated. So re remembering portions of the Quran particularly, excuse me, to, uh, in order to seek remedy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the whispers of the shaitan. Sometimes we're too busy to say them. But we should always remember the importance of saying it before we sleep and after every obligatory prayer. Ayat al-kursi. And of course, uh, and uh, lastly, reciting Surah Al-Baqarah at home. The shaitan does not remain in a house wherein Surah Al-Baqarah is recited. And of course, the scholars have differed. Is it okay to play a CD or a tape wherein it's recited? Or can you, you have to recite it yourself? There's a difference of opinion, but we won't differ that it's better that one of us does it himself, his wife, his children. Anyways, the Surah Al-Baqarah being recited at home. So, in summary, there are many different entrances that the shaitan has in modern times among them are many things he used in the old times. We as believers have to be wise and educated, not only in the secular knowledge, but more importantly in how to protect ourselves from these satanic traps. Because being a doctor is not going to help you against shaitan nor being an engineer. What will help one of us against shaitan is knowing from where he is able to attack one of us and then knowing how to create an obstacle and a block in his way. The one who does so is the successful one. This is the one who will succeed in this life and when, they, when he meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or when she meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not anything else. Not that we're saying don't become ignorant of other matters of the world, no. A Muslim should be up to date and should be qualified in whatever will make him a better Muslim. So that we are superior to everybody else in the world. In terms of religious commitment, in terms of adhering to the truth, in terms of the, the worldly knowledge, in terms of being uh, productive people. On all fronts, we should be leaders. Because the Prophet ﷺ was a leader and the Sahaba were leaders and we follow their footsteps. So we try to be leaders in all aspects of life without falling into the trap by favoring the dunya over the akhirah. And in the Salah, what did the Imam recite? Kalla bal tuhibbuna al-ajila wa tadharuna al-akhirah You love the hasty life, the, the, the transitory life and you abandon the life to come. But the true believer is the one who prepares for the life to come and the dunya will come to him. When the dunya comes, it has one of two locations. The heart or the hand. If we grab it with the hand, alhamdulillah, you can have a nice car and you can look nice and you can no problem. But if it makes it to the heart, then we're off the track. So there's no problem in being knowledgeable in matters that are not necessarily religious provided that they do not or are not given precedence. They're not given precedence over the deen of Allah and his rights. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, it's a long mission. But Allah shall make it easy for those who strive. The evidence, Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا 
لنهدينهم سبلنا وان الله لمع المحسنين those who strive in our path in our way we shall guide them to the paths and verily ever is Allah with those who excel Allah promised if you if we do our effort if we make our effort we strive Allah promised he will guide us to the path so it's not mission impossible it's not mission impossible but it is not a picnic it is not a picnic you go you live life you have a nice mattress and you lie down you put your feet up you drink some mango juice and you think you're gonna go to Jannah it doesn't happen this way we have to make an effort and Allah will facilitate. But how long is it going to be? 500 years? If it was 500 years, Allah is worthy of more. But the average Muslim lives 60 to 70 years. Some make it beyond that. The average life, many people die in accidents at a very younger age. Anyways, once someone dies, it's done. It's done. Which could be today, tomorrow, next minute. Allah knows best. We have to be ready now. We have to, each one of us, each one of us, before we leave this masjid, do it, have a checklist and a self-evaluation. Where has the shaitan taken over? Where has he defeated me? In what areas? And let's have the determination and the conviction to leave this masjid with a sincere tawbah to Allah. And that we don't give him access again. Each one knows his problems. I know my problems. Each one of us, each one of you knows his problem. But don't make this a, a trivial issue. It is not. It is the fine line between Jannah and Jahannam. Either we are Hezbollah or Hezbollah Shaitan. I'm not speaking about politics. I'm speaking about the Quran. Allah called them Hezbollah, okay? Either we're one of these two. So where do we belong? That's what it boils down to. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us among those who understand this, who act upon it. And I ask Allah to facilitate our path uh, leading to Firdaus in the company of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Jazakumullahu khayran wa baraka fikum jami'an. And I look forward to seeing you inshallah in the future whenever Allah Azza wa Jal allows it. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.